Well, welcome to church today. Trust and pray that you had a good weekend. Glad you're here this morning. Find you a seat, and we'll start our services today. Thank you for everybody that participated last night. The trunk or treat went very well. If you're visiting today, welcome to church. We're glad you're here. And I'm going to need a good praise the Lord and hand clap of praise right here that there's a miracle sitting at the piano this morning. How about that? That how many of you believe that God answers prayer? I started praying this week, and I said, Lord, Terry told me, well, I'm bringing Rocky to church, and I said, Lord, I know you can touch him, and he can play that piano. And I'm certainly thankful that God answers prayer, aren't you? And on that note, here's how I want to start the service this morning. The Lord impresses me to do this sometimes. There's a lot of needs in our church. There's a lot of sick people in our church, and I just want to gather around the altar this morning let's come and let's pray and ask the Lord to be with these needs ask him to meet with us how many of you came asking God to speak to you today well let's believe he will would you come get around the altar with me today let's ask the Lord to fix our minds upon him this morning whatever you need is he's got the answer Our most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for another time to come into your house. Thank you for the freedom and the privilege that we have to do so. Father, thank you for touching Brother Rocky this week that he's able to play the piano. God, thank you that for the assurance that you answer prayer and that, Lord, Jeremiah said there's nothing too hard for you. Father, I pray today over every need of our church, Lord, over every need of this community, God, for the sick that need healing, Lord, for the lost that need salvation. Father, we pray for them today. Father, right now upon this altar, I pray you'd clear our hearts and clear our minds of everything else other than Jesus. Father, I pray today that you'd fix our minds, Lord, to the hills from whence cometh our help, to know that our help comes from the Lord. Father, as Brother Roger leads the choir today, I pray you'd anoint them, Lord, to usher us into your presence. And Father, as we worship through your word in just a little while, I pray you to open our hearts and dissect our hearts with your word. Father, I pray today if there's somebody in here that does not know you as Savior and Lord of their life, God, I pray today would be the day that you would draw them and that they would have the boldness to make that decision. Father, I pray that you do in this place this morning what only you can. Lord, remove from our minds what we're going to do the rest of the day. Remove from our minds the time on our watches and help us just to worship you. For, Lord, you are worthy of our praise. Father, I pray today that you do in this place everything, Lord, that I can't even begin to ask you to do. I pray that the Holy Ghost of God would move up and down these pews and would minister to our hearts. Give us a taste of heaven today. In Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. Why are you come? Let's worship the Lord today. Give me the hands coming up here. When we remodel, we're going to put rails in for people like this. You touch me. Don't throw Brother Eric a monkey wrench. We ask you to stand this morning. We begin our songs this morning. Yeah. yeah. I got to thank him. Come out of the prayer room. That's what was praying. Amen. Amen. Follow along on the screen. He touched me. Shackled by a head.
bless that wonderful name. That's what we're here to do today. Amen. Amen. step out and shake someone's hand. Great to see Brother Bob and Miss Elma here with us this morning in church this morning. Welcome someone to Black Oak Baptist Church. Would you do that this morning?
Jesus kids got dismissed out the back. If you need them to go out there, you can dismiss them. Amen. Amen. Before our pastor comes and preaches this morning, we're going to do one more song. The old rugged cross. Amen. Follow along on the screen. just thank you today for the opportunity to be in your house today. Thank you for the cross, Lord, that where you shed your blood upon Calvary, that we could have life and have it more abundant. One day we'll lay our trophies and our failures and our faults down, Lord, and pick up a new robe and crown on the other side of heaven. We thank you for that promise today, Lord. ask that you would bless our pastor as he comes to speak the word today, Lord. Open the hearts of the people. Thank you for all that you do for us. Bless our great nation. We pray for it today, Lord. 
our servicemen and women, all of our missionaries out on the battlefield. We lift them up to you. Ask that you just be with us and guide us, lead God and direct us throughout this day. All this we ask in your blessing, sweet and holy name, and all of God's people said, Amen. 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 If you're glad you're saved, say Amen. Amen. I think we've witnessed the ability of the Lord this morning. I, I think Brother Rocky would be okay if I said this. I've never seen anybody have a stroke two weeks later play the piano like that. That's just what God can do, and I wonder what you need this morning. He can do it all the time. God is good. Take your Bibles to 1 John with me this morning, chapter number 5. 1 John, chapter number 5. The Lord laid this upon my heart this week, and with the help of the Lord, I'd like to deal with a topic that I believe many Christians struggle with, and I I've counseled with many people that have struggled with this. I have friends that have struggled with this. And when I was a young Christian myself, I struggled with this. In 1 John chapter number 5, when you get there, would you stand to your feet? Honor and reverence to the Word of God. With the help of the Lord, I'd like to preach this thought this morning, knowing that you have eternal life. Look in verse number 13, just one verse. 1 John chapter 5 this morning. John said, now let me give you context of where we are. He gives no a greeting and no farewell to this letter. So scholars have just settled on the fact that John is writing to the church at whole. So he's writing to Black Oak Baptist Church this morning. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, he said, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Pray with me this morning. Lord, thank you, Lord, for the worship this morning. Thank you for allowing us to be, Lord, in this sacred place to lift up the name of Jesus. And, Lord, as we come to this time of your word, Lord, I need your help to preach. Empty me of myself. Empty me of pride. Lord, cleanse me of sin and vainglory this morning that I might be, Lord, a tool in your hand to preach your word to these people today. Father, set me to the side that you might be glorified. Help me to lift up the name of Jesus today to preach your word. Lord, I pray today that if there's somebody here that's never been saved, that, Lord, does not have the assurance of eternal life, that today you would draw them to yourself. But, Father, if there's a Christian here today that can remember a time in their life that they called on you as their Lord and Savior, but right now they're doubting their salvation, Lord, I believe you've made it my mission today to preach to them that they might settle this once and for all to know that they have eternal life. Father, would you do it this morning and would you preach to us, bind the enemy. Lord, hide me behind Calvary's cross and seal the armor of God on me today. Lord, that I might do what you've called me to do. And I'll thank you for it and give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. I want to deal with that thought today, knowing that you have eternal life. And I want to deal with it the way that John deals with it in this verse. He, he gives his mission is twofold. Look in verse 13 again. And leave your Bibles open. I'm going to take you through 1 John this morning. First of all, he said, these things have I written unto you. Now notice this in your Bible. He said, I've written unto you that believe. So John makes it his mission first to write to those that believe on the name of the Son of God. How many of you believe on the name of Jesus this morning? Well, he's writing to you. And he said, this is why he's writing. Look what he said. Underline it, circle it, that you may know that you have eternal life. Can I say this morning that I don't have a hope so salvation? That I don't have a think so salvation? That I don't have, I hope I get it right one day salvation. But today I have a no-so salvation. And I can say to you one thing that I used to not be able to say. As an early Christian, I had a struggle, Brother Rick, where I doubted my salvation. I doubted that I was good enough for Jesus to save me. I doubted that the things that I were doing were good enough for him to keep me. But it wasn't until, and I've got something written in the bottom of my Bible. Brother Dawson. 
Johnson asked me when he first announced his call to preach, he said, Matthew, I feel weird about marking in my Bible. Is it okay? And I said, yes, it's okay. You mark that thing up so you'll remember things. Written in the bottom of my Bible on 1 John chapter 5 was dated back to when I was an early Christian, had this Bible since right after I got saved. And Brother Roger, there's a note written there of when I doubted my salvation and the Lord showed me that I could know that I have eternal life. That I, as I talked to a man the other day and I told you about it, he said, preacher, he said, when I stand before God, then I'll know if I can get into heaven. And I said, sir, if you wait till then, you won't get into heaven, but you can know right now, this moment, that if you died, that heaven would be your home for all of eternity. First of all, John's writing to the church. He's writing to those that believe. He's writing to you, dear friend, insert your name, that you may know that you have eternal life. But look at his second fold purpose there in the verse. He said that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Dear friend, if you've never believed on Jesus, he's writing to you this morning that you might believe. I want to show you what he said in the first part of the verse. Notice he said, these things have I written unto you. What things is John talking about? Well, I, I want you to go through 1 John just for a minute with me. And I want you to go back to 1 John chapter number 1. He's ending this epistle, uh, this letter that he writes. Now, he'll address the second one to some ladies, but he doesn't address the first epistle I told you. And we take that he's writing in that day contextually to Christians that were scattered abroad. Now, I need to remind you who the author is here. John is my favorite writer in the Bible, and that's because he was the one that was whom Jesus loved. He was the one uh, that leaned upon the bosom of Jesus at the Last Supper. You remember? John was the only one that was at the foot of the cross when Jesus Jesus was crucified, and he gives us these accounts. He will tie in the Gospel of John to 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and Revelation. The same man wrote all of them. But look in 1st John chapter number 2 and verse number 1. Let's dissect what he's talking about. These things have I written unto you. In 1st John chapter 2 verse 1, he said, My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Listen what he said. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the world. He is the substitute in our place. Look what he said in chapter number 2 and verse number 25. He's writing to them, and he said, This is the promise that he has promised us even eternal life. Look what he said in chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Look at verse 5. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. What are these things? What he's already written to them. Look in chapter 3, verse 8. Mark these if you struggle with doubting your salvation. He said, He that committeth sin is the devil, is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Verse 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. I'm only giving you a synopsis this morning when he says these things. He's talking about every word and every T that he has crossed. Brother Roger, up until this point uh, that we might know that we have eternal life. Let me show you just a few more and I'll get on. Look at chapter 4 verse number 9. He said, in this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might believe and that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now lastly, look at chapter 5, verse 11. He said, this is the record that God has given to us, eternal life, and this life is in his son. He that hath the son hath life, and he that hath not the son of God
God hath not life. John is synopsing, putting together the Gospels that we record in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, he's writing about the things that the Old Testament prophets would tell us. Uh, he's going all the way back to what Isaiah said, uh, that he would be as a sheep before the slaughter, uh, that, that we did hid our faces from him, that he was despised and rejected, that he was a man of sorrows, that he was acquainted with grief. Dear friend, do you know how you know you can have eternal life today? Because the Bible says that you can have eternal life today. Uh, you can't trust many things in the world today. I don't trust what the news media puts out. It's all hogwash. Uh, I don't trust what's in the newspaper. You can't believe any of it. Uh, I don't believe any of this stuff the new politicians are saying because they won't keep their promises on it. Uh, but you can take it to the bank tonight uh, that the Word of God is still inspired. It's still in error. And it's still infallible. It's without error. And in it is our hope today. And John said, you know, can I put it in East Tennessee language? Preacher, how can I know I have eternal life? Because Jesus said you can know. Because John said because he was the propitiation, the propitiation for our sins. He's the substitute for our sin. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners that Christ died for us. That he that knew no sin became sin for us. That we might be made into the righteousness of God in him. Dear friend, Jesus said, I came not to call the righteous for those that are not sick, they do not need a physician. He said, but I came to call sinners to repentance. The very reason that Jesus came was to rescue you from your problem called sin. The very reason that Jesus came was to give you the hope of eternal life. He said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. You know what I learned early on in my Christian life? When I was a Pray and now can I remind you I've told you my salvation story about the time Jesus the day before I turned 15 I walked in I'll ask Jesus to save me and I'm just being honest because I learned I need to be transparent as your pastor. Right after I got saved, Brother Don, for a while, I didn't have that eternal security. I had eternal security because of what Christ did for me, but I was not resting in that eternal security. Can I say the eternal life that Jesus gives, it does give us eternal security. It's an eternal salvation. It's an enduring salvation. And you and I can have hope today that when we lay our heads on our pillows tonight, that we can know that we have eternal life. Dear friend you've asked Jesus to save you and you've genuinely repented of your sin and you're making the effort to live for him you can know that you have eternal life look at verse 7 and I'll get to my message today that's just by way of introduction look at verse 7 he said for there are three that bear record in heaven the father the word and the holy ghost and these three are one I'd like to take this verse today and show you how you can know that you have eternal life First of all, John said, the three that bear record in heaven, he said, first of all, is the Father. I thought about through the New Testament, I thought about the times that the Father bore record. In Matthew chapter 3, verse number 17, John the Baptist has just baptized the Lord Jesus Christ. And lo, a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. If you go over to Matthew chapter 17 and verse number 5, Peter, James, and John are with the Lord Jesus Christ at the Mount Truth Transfiguration. And Right after Jesus is transfigured, the voice comes from heaven, Brother Don, and said, Behold, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Can I remind you what I thought about this week? That in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, John said. Uh, that in the beginning when God said, Let there be light, uh, it was already set in motion before Adam and Eve ever sinned in the garden. Uh, he already knew what they would do. Somebody say amen. Uh, we like to blame them them for it but if I'd have been there I'd have done the same thing uh, and if you'd have been there you'd have done the same thing that they did uh, and we blame it on them but before that ever happened the Lord knew that it would and he already had set in motion that the son of God uh, well he was there when he said let there be light uh, the trinity has always been in perfect unity and that's what that verse declares the trinity uh, and that from the beginning of time God already had the plan to send his only son for a substitutionary death in your place Does that not blow your mind? That in Genesis chapter number 3, that God would take the innocent animal 
and he would kill it and he would make Adam and Eve close the very first picture in your Bible we have of what Jesus would do for us. That in the beginning, now, now that I can't wrap my mind around this, that you know what that word eternal means in our Bible in the New Testament? It means from without beginning and without end, the Greek word, I'm not going to try to pronounce it, but it means that it always was and it always has been, that there was no beginning, but it is forever and ever and ever, and God has existed from eternity past, and he's looked into eternity future, and he's made a way for every human being. I don't believe in a Calvinistic gospel. I don't believe in a predestined gospel. I believe in a whosoever gospel today uh, that if you'll believe on the name of the Lord Jesus and listen to me, you'll repent of your sin. It's not enough to believe. Jesus said the devils believe. Uh, you've got to repent of your sin and throw yourself on the mercy of, and grace of God in order to have that eternal life. The record of the Father. You know, I think about it in my mind right now in heaven, this world's upside down. Somebody say amen. But right now in heaven, the Father's still sitting on the throne. And his witness is still true. You know what Jesus told them Pharisees and told everybody that came after him and started to question him? He said, the Father hath sent me. And the Father will finish what he has sent me for. I thought about the Father and the record that he bears, Brother Roger, and I'm thinking about one day after a while uh, when God calls time on this thing uh, and he looks over at the Son uh, and the record of the Father will now be, Son, go and get your children and then he'll get us out of here. But dear friend, you better make sure you're ready before then. He's got, we got the record of the Father. Look at verse 7 again. He said, we also have the record of the Word. Who's the Word, preacher? I'm glad you asked. Let me show, tell you. In John chapter number 1 and verse number 14, the Bible will tell us, John, the same writer, will tell us who the Word is. He'll say, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In Revelation chapter number 19 and verse number 13, John the Revelator saw the Lord Jesus, and he said, He that was clothed with a vessel dipped in blood, and His name was called the Word of God. Preacher, who is the Word of God? It's the Lord Jesus himself and the record that he bore. I thought about John chapter number 10 when Jesus was writing about being that good shepherd. And I'm going to spend some time and get excited here about Jesus being the good shepherd. He said in John 10 verse 27, my sheep know my voice and I know them and they follow me. Notice the personal pronoun. He said and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand the record of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, preacher how can that make me sure I have eternal life uh, because he was the one that was willing uh, when the father looked over at him uh, and eternity passed uh, and said son there's going to be a day uh, he already knew uh, but he said there's going to be a day uh, that you'll go to that place of Golgotha the place of the skull uh, you'll go to bloody Calvary uh, and you'll give your life uh, for every lost sinner that will ever live uh, and by the way that that's ever person uh, that's ever had breath in their lungs. Uh, and the, Jesus looked over and he didn't say, Father, go find somebody else. Uh, there was nobody else that could do it. Uh, but he said, as that old song says, uh, Father, I will go uh, and I'll pay their debt. Uh, uh, their sin debt through Calvary's flow. Uh, and you know what I declare today, Brother Roger? That it's still the blood uh, that brings victory to me. Uh, what is the witness of the Son? Uh, that he lived 33 three and a half perfect sinless years of his life. He never did wrong. He never sinned. There was never guile found in his mouth, Isaiah said. But he went up the Via Della Rosa and they beat him there and they whipped him in the courtyard and they nailed him to a cross. But it wasn't the nails, Brother Rick, that held him there. It was his love for you and me and the testimony of the Son upon the cross. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. And you know what else he cried out? You ought to be able to pronounce the Aramaic word. Me and Brother Ralph say it so much. In John chapter number 9, he said, To tell us, I, what is the record of the Son? He said, It is finished. 
You know what he said in John chapter 10 before he ever got to the cross? He said, I'm the good shepherd and I'm laying my life down for you. There's, I could spend so much time here about the record of the son that he told them disciples that you'll destroy the temple and in three days I'll build it again. And they said, Master, this temple's been in building yet 40 years. Uh, how are you going to do that? But he did not speak concerning the physical temple, but his body he spoke about. Uh, he gave the witness so many times to the disciples that I'm going to that place called Calvary. Uh, uh, John would tell us in John, in the last chapter, I believe it is, his very reason for writing the Gospels and the Epistles is the same reason for verse 13, that we might know the Son of God uh, and that we might believe that we can have life through his name. Uh, dear friend, I have the testimony of the Father that Jesus was and is his beloved Son. I have the testimony of the Son uh, that he is the good shepherd, that he laid down his life for me and that he keeps me in his hand. But I want to read to you verse 29 of John 10. The testimony in the Father and the Son are one. He said, My Father which gave them to me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. I about had a spell sitting in my office the other day. Maybe you didn't catch it yet, but Jesus said in verse number 28, He said, No man will pluck them out of my hand. In verse number 29, He said, No man can pluck them out of my father's hand you know why that is because the testimony of the father and the testimony of the son are the same testimony this morning and not only is Jesus holding you in his hand but the father is holding Jesus in his hand which means that I'm inside his hand and I'm inside of the father's hand you know what that reminds me of he's got the whole world in his hands did I give you peace today that's why you can know that you're saved that Jesus was willing because he loved you to die in your place while we were yet sinners Romans 5 6 when we were without strength in due time Romans 3 23 that the wages of sin is death Romans 6 23 but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ that is the witness of the son this morning can I tell you that Jesus wants you to know that you have eternal life he doesn't want you to live your life laying your head on your pillow at night, worrying about what will happen when you die. Can I say when the devil, when you doubt your salvation, it's nothing but a trick of the devil? Now, I will say sometimes the devil try to convince you that you are saved when you're not. I, I worry when people say, Preacher, I'm good. That man I talked to said, Preacher, he said, I'm saved. He told me a date. He told me a time and everything. And I said, Well, praise the Lord. Do you know you're going to heaven when you die? And he said, No, nobody does. My heart is burdened for you if that's you today. But not only, let, let me show you this, not only in verse 7 of 1 John do we have the record of the Father and the Word, but we have the record of the Holy Ghost. Can I give you a verse about that? ought to make you excited tonight. This is the verse that the Lord helped me with when I went through that bondage of doubting and I was in the trap of the enemy. In Romans chapter 8, verse 16, Paul said, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The Father... He bears record, Brother Don, that he sent Jesus. At the coronation of his ministry at his baptism, he declares, he's my beloved son, I am well pleased in him, and he's coming to do the work that I've sent him to do. Jesus declared his whole life, I'm coming to lay down my life for the sheep. But the Holy Ghost signified that the Spirit of God beareth witness with our spirit. Now, in a Baptist church, we, we, we get scared when we call him the Holy Ghost, but that's what John called him, the Holy Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit can i ask you a question it's what i ask people when they say preacher i'm doubting my salvation and don't overestimate don't overthink the question have you ever felt the spirit of god have you ever felt the spirit of god resonate in your soul have we ever been singing a song and worship got on brother rocky's pounding that piano or the organ whichever one he's on tommy's on the other one Roger's leading the choir, and we get Jamie starts to sing about all the things we can thank him for. Miss Beverly starts to sing about them searching through heaven, and oh, what a Savior. Jenny and Haley get up and start singing about what Jesus has done and how he provides for it, and something resonates inside of your soul that you can't explain. You ever been driving down the road, and you got your worship music on, and you feel something resonate in your soul, and you get not goosebumps but glory bumps all over your body. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You ever been in your prayer place and the Spirit of God's got down there with you and you felt the Spirit of God in your soul? Have you? That's witness that you're saved this morning. Now, I can't tell you that you're saved. One day you can't say, Lord, preacher told me if I ever felt your Spirit that I was saved. That's between you and Him. 
The only I can't I can't even tell Haley if she's saved. I see the fruit of her life, but I can tell myself I know I'm saved because of what Jesus has done. Have you ever felt the Spirit of God move in your life? Well, Paul said that's the witness that we are believers. Because if we are not of Him, we have not the Spirit of God, the Bible said. But if we are in Him, we have the Spirit of God. Lastly, look at verse 7. There's three that bear record. The Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost. And I like what he said. And these three are one. I can't explain the Trinity to you just as much as you can't explain it to me. But I believe it. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all have a place in salvation. All have a place. Can I show you how? The Father sent the Son. The Son willingly came and died in your place. And the Holy Spirit of God is who draws you to the Lord. Can I tell you about that day real quick again? I was sitting in the back pew of that church, and I, I can't tell you what the preacher preached that day. I, I can't tell you what the choir sung. I can't tell you what I was wearing. I, I, can't, I couldn't tie a tie then, Brother Roger, so I doubt I was wearing one then. I couldn't tell you what was going on, but I can tell you what was happening in my soul. It's what had been happening in my soul for about four or five weeks on end. And I, Brother David mentioned it in Sunday school that I was white-knuckling, and we all do it, white-knuckle gripping the pew. And I remember sitting right back there where Brother Doug and Sister Sherry are where I was sitting in that church, and I was squeezing that pew. Can I tell you what was happening? I had realized in my heart that the Father had sent the Son, and I had realized that the Son had died for me. I had realized the testimony of the Son when he got up out of the grave by his own power, and he told them disciples, I will appear before you in Galilee. And they forgot what he said, and the women and came to anoint the body of Jesus at the tomb and the angel is sitting on the tomb on the stone and said why seek ye the living of the among, among the dead I know you seek Jesus who is crucified but he's not here for he's risen and Jesus appeared before them and he said all hell and Galilee and they fell before him on their faces dead the testimony of the son was that he said I'm going to die and I'm going to rise again and he did rise again can I remind you that if Jesus did not get out of the grave that the cross would be in vain today but he got out of the grave he conquered death hell and the grave and that's why we can know we have eternal life I realized those things that day but then something started to happen in my soul it wasn't emotionalism it wasn't me being charismatic but it was the spirit of God it was like there was a rope tied to me and he was trying to pull me uh, you that are saved you know what I'm talking about say amen I didn't brother Don I didn't tap on the person next to me and say do you feel that I didn't tap on the person next to me, Brother Connor, and say, do you hear that? I didn't say, who is that talking to me like Samuel did? But I said, yes, Lord, I hear your voice. You know what Jesus was saying to me for those weeks on end? Matthew, I want to save you. But, Lord, I'm not good enough. Matthew, I died for you anyways. But, Lord, you don't know what I've done. Yes, I do, Matthew. I see everything. And I'm already willing to forgive you of everything. In September 9, 2011, about 1230, that Spirit of God was pulling me harder than it ever had before. I was squeezing that pew harder than I ever had before, but there was a voice that witnessed into my soul, the witness of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. You know what it was? It said, Matthew, this is the last opportunity I'm ever going to give you to get saved. Preacher, how could a loving God do that? People get saved on their deathbed. Yes, they do, but it's the mercy of God that you and I only get one chance. It's the grace of God that we only get one chance. Anything after that's only the mercy of God. Do you deserve salvation? Say amen. No, you don't. Neither do I. Nobody deserves salvation. But God gave it anyways. You don't deserve the chance to be saved. I don't deserve the chance to be saved. So why is God obligated to give us more than one chance? He's not. But it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. Can I tell you that day, I let go of the pew. The, the, Jesus said that the Father will draw them, the Holy Spirit will draw them, and I, I've told you about it. I stepped out from where I was. I've had people tell me I was lying, but you can tell me whatever you want to think. Brother Roger, I took two steps about the same distance from the back of this church to the front, and all I knew is I was at the altar. I can't tell you what I said when I got there. I find no sinner's prayer in the Bible. That's why when you come, I don't say repeat these words, and, these, and if you do it just right, you'll be saved. I say just call on the name of Jesus. 
because I fell down on my face. That pastor got down with his Bible, and my youth leader was behind me, and she's weeping and crying because they'd been praying for me. They're the ones that got me in church when I wasn't going to church. And there on that altar, I called upon the name of the Father. I called upon the name of the Son, and I called upon the Holy Ghost. Maybe not like that out loud, but in that moment, God took every guilty stain, and he washed it away, and he gave me a clean slate, gave me a new record, and that I can know that I have eternal life. But after that day, I didn't rest in that all the time. One day, I was leaving Zion Hill Baptist Church. I just had a singing there on a Sunday night. I was driving my Toyota Camry on the way home, and I would already started preaching by this point. I was driving my Toyota Camry on the way home, and I, I, I mean, if you know what it's like to doubt your salvation, I was really doubting my salvation. And I was driving down the road, and then the Holy Spirit of God spoke to me like I just told you about. The Spirit itself bears witness with us that we're the children of God. And you know what he said, Matthew? I, 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 I tried to figure it out. I tried to figure out how I could get peace. And he said, Matthew, that day that you asked me the very first time I saved you and I sealed you unto the day of redemption, you are saved. Stop acting like this. You're talking about going to clean up ditches on both sides of Hines Creek Road. When the Lord spoke to me. Can I tell you ever since then what I've realized? That the Spirit of God bears witness in my soul that I'm His child. That the Spirit of God reminds me when the devil comes and reminds me of all the things I've done in my life, reminds me how unworthy and how undeserving I am of my salvation, that the Holy Spirit directs my mind back to that day on that green carpet in Union Chapel Missionary Baptist Church in Kingston, Tennessee, where I fell on my face before a thrice holy God. I don't remember what I prayed, but I know what happened. And that's as far as the devil can go. I have no doubt in my mind this morning, and I'm coming to a close, I have no doubt in my mind this morning that I'm preaching to people who have genuinely been born again, but you've been living in doubt for such a long time. You've been worried that God won't accept you. You've been worried that you said the wrong words. You've been worried that you didn't get saved in the right place. You've been worried that you didn't tell people or get baptized fast enough. But dear friend, if it was up to you to get saved, you would never get saved. Jesus did all of the work, and he just asked that you follow him in faith. The Lord told me to tell somebody, you need to quit overcomplicating things. He's written his word to you that already believe, to you that have asked Jesus to save you, that you could know that you have eternal life. Isn't that good news? That you can rest in that fact. But the Lord's also told me to warn somebody this morning that has a counterfeit salvation and you think everything's all right. Or maybe you're wondering, did I really do things right? Dear friend, this is the test. Did you call upon Jesus in repentance? I didn't ask you if you cried. I didn't ask you what you said when you got done. But did you call upon him in repentance in your soul? sorry for who you were and the things you've done and turns your life over to him if you've not genuinely done that today john says we have the record in the word of god so that we can believe that he is the son of god you know what paul said in romans chapter number 10 verse number 8 he said that if we believe in our heart dear friend i want to talk to you for a second you've never called upon jesus you know in this moment that if you died hell would be your home for all of eternity That's still the truth of the word of God today, that if you die lost without Christ in your life, that you will spend an eternity in that place called hell. How do you know, preacher? Because it's appointed man wants to die, and after this the judgment. If you know you need to be saved, I'm talking to you for a minute. Paul said that if you'll believe in your heart, the Lord Jesus. Can I ask you a question? Do you believe in your heart that Jesus was sent by the Father? You don't have to understand it all. I still don't understand it all. But do you believe in your heart that the Father sent the Son and that the Son loves you so much no matter what you've done, no matter who your family is, no matter how much money you have, that the Son loved you enough that he died in your place? By faith, Billy Graham said, first there's the fact that Jesus died and rose again. Next, there's the faith. Do you believe that he got up out of the grave by his own power? that he's seated on the right-hand side of the throne of God. Me and Ralph talked about this the other day. It's something I learned in Bible college I didn't really know, that I've told you about Yom Kippur all these times, that day of atonement when that earthly Levitical priest was done sacrificing for all of Israel, he sat down in front of the people. And all the people rejoiced because their sins were forgiven. When Jesus got out of the grave, he sat down on the right-hand side of the throne of God. 
and he's never coming to die again. Do you believe in your heart that one day he's coming again and that he's going to take his church away? Preacher, how do you know that? The Word of God says it, and I believe it. Do you believe that in your heart today? Well, Paul said if you'll confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Preacher, what does that mean? Confessing him the Lord over your life. Lord, I believe that you died for me. I believe, John 14, 6, that you're the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father but through you. I believe. And you confess him as your mouth. Here's what Paul said. Romans chapter number 10, verse 9, 10. He said, thou shalt be saved. Verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's pray this morning. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Brother Rocky, if you can, will you come, please? Can I ask you today, first of all, Christian, do you remember a time in your life? You, you, you can't remember the day, that's all right. But you remember a time in your life where your life changed. Preacher, I, I really remember the day that I got saved. But I, I, I've just got doubt in my soul. I'm so uneasy. I'm so afraid. Dear friend, I wonder, would you find a place on the altar today? Dear Christian, would you find a place on the altar today? Say, Lord, would you help me to have the peace that passes understanding? Lord, would you? I know your spirit is bore witness in my soul. I have felt the spirit of God, and your word says that means I'm your child. There's no explaining when you feel God. There's no way anything feels like it. But, Lord, would you help me to believe again? Would you help me to trust again? Dear child of God, Lord told me to say this. Maybe you're not doubting your salvation, but maybe you're not rejoicing over your salvation anymore. I wonder if you'd find a place on the altar. Preacher, I know 100% sure if I died right now, heaven's my home. I wonder if you'd find a place on the altar and rejoice in your salvation again. Thank you, Lord, for sending your only son to die for somebody like me. Thank you that I don't have to spend an eternity in hell but that I can have an eternity with you. But dear friend, the most important question that anybody will ever ask you this side of eternity, do you know that Jesus is your Savior? Preacher, I've never truly repented. I've never called upon His name, and I need to do that today. I'll be down here with my Bible. You can take the person beside you. You can come down the aisle with them. But I'd love to take my Bible today and show you how you can have eternal life. What Jesus has done for you. Dear friend, preacher, I'll settle it later. This might be your last opportunity. You're not entitled to make it home. You're not entitled to make it out of this church before Jesus comes again. Would you respond to the Lord today? Would you settle it in your heart to get peace? Or dear friend, if you've never been saved, would you just take the first step? And if he's drawing you today, he'll take the rest of the steps. Father, I thank you for this day. Thank you for this time in your house. Thank you for your word. Lord, thank you that we can know that we have eternal life. Thank you that we don't have to guess at it. We don't have to hope for it or wonder what will happen. But thank you that we can know, Lord, on the authority of your word, that you're holding us in your hand and the Father's holding us in his hand. Lord, thank you for the Trinity that bears witness in your word and in our life. I pray for the person today, Father, that is truly saved, but that's had, that has some doubt. Lord, I pray you'd help them to believe again. Help them to find a place this morning. Help them to settle that. Father, I pray for the Christian that's not rejoicing over their salvation anymore. Help them to find a place and ask you to restore the joy of your salvation to their life. But, Father, I pray for the person nearest hell this morning. Lord, that if they died right now in this moment, that they would be eternally separated from you forever, without beginning and without end. Lord, I pray that you would bind the enemy and they would take a step of faith today and they would come kneel at an altar and that they would call on the name of Jesus that they could leave today knowing where they'll spend eternity. Father, would you bind the enemy and draw us in this time? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? Brother Roger sings, I wonder, would you step out and come? Don't be ashamed, would you come? Just as, Just as you are, would you come? I am without one tree, but Christians are praying, would you come?
that you'll spend an eternity in heaven. Do you have that assurance today? If you don't, you can. as Rocky continues to play but everybody bow your head close your eyes as God continues to deal with some on the altar right there would you say Lord if you're doubting your salvation but you know there's been a time you've called on Jesus Lord would you remind me of that day Lord would you help me to know in my heart if it was genuine Lord would you help me to settle this battle once and for all today to know that I have eternal life. Dear friend, maybe you're not rejoicing in it. Lord, would you help me to be happy again that I'm saved? Would you give me the tears back when I read your word and when I worship you, remembering what you've done for me? But maybe you've never made that decision. Let me say that I'll be the last one to leave today you can find me, you can find Roger, you can find Ralph, you can find anybody. We'll be glad to take our Bibles today and show you about what you can't do, but what God can do. Dear friend, there's so much hope in the Lord. Just if we'll choose to trust in it. I just feel like we need to sing one more verse if we can do that, please. We'll go home after this. If you need to come, would you? With many a conflict, many a doubt, fighting there it is. Ends and fear. Within, would you just come? and pray that you've responded to the Lord today as he's dealt with you. If you're glad you could know that you have eternal life, say amen. 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 You can be seated just for a moment. Let me give you a few announcements. And then I've got a card to read you, and then we'll go home today. Uh, tonight, uh, Pam Weston will be here singing. Um, we'll have a singing service the fifth Sunday of the month. So she'll be here 
uh, tonight singing, so you come out and support her. Uh, Mickey and Barbara are having a baby shower in the gym for Barbara's daughter uh, this Saturday at 1 o'clock, so if you can come to that, they wanted the church to know that you're invited. Um, so if you can come to that, you do that. Today's your last chance to give toward the pajama offering for uh, Northern Lights for Alaska. The envelopes are on the back table. If you've got some extra cash, you can give toward that so some kids can have some new pajamas this Christmas. Um, today is the Blessing Box Giving Day. There's also envelopes if you want to designate giving to stock that Blessing Box. It's getting emptied now more than ever. Or if you got some stuff in your pantry that's not expired and non-perishable, if you're going by the store, you can donate today. And then there's shoe boxes for OCC or right at the back door behind Brother Charlie there. So on your way out, uh, grab one of those. Uh, as of right now, we've got well over $1,000 in offerings, so we're going to be able to pack a lot of those. But if you want to give, you can. Or if you want to take a box and pack it uh, yourself, you can, okay? Let me read you this card from the Belcher family. It says, your kindness has made a difference, and your thoughtfulness touched my heart. Thank you. We are so grateful for everything that you've done for us this past month. This has been the worst time of our lives, and we're so thankful to have such a wonderful church family. Thank you for the prayers, the visits, the food, and for the loving us through this. I don't really have the words to express how thankful we are, and we love you all from Michelle and Olivia. We love you guys, too, and we're still praying for you. Any, anything else before we go home this morning? Thank you, Brother Ralph. Pray for Miss Henrietta Hunley. She is taking a turn for the worse, and she's in the hospital, and it's pretty serious. So you remember her when you pray. Brother Ralph, you come, dismiss us in prayer, if you will, and you pray for Henrietta this morning. After he prays, you'll be at liberty to go. We'll see you at 6 tonight for the singing, okay? Good to see you this morning. You come close. Pray, pray for that as well, if you will, brother. After he prays, you'll be at liberty to go. Let's take a second and let the Lord fill our hearts. We thank you, dear Lord, for the message that we receive today, O oh Lord. Allow it to give us our strength. Renew us when we are in doubt, O oh Lord. Allow us to see clearly into the future, O oh Lord, and the blessings the Lord has bestowed upon us. We thank you, dear Lord, for all you have done for us, the strength that you have given us. There are so many unspoken requests and spoken requests upon our hearts, O Lord. We know that you have heard them all, and you will act on your will, O Lord, according to those requests. We ask, O Lord, that we be of open mind and understanding with the resolution of how those requests are treated by you, O Lord. For we know that you are the creator, and you are in charge of everything, O oh Lord. We are merely here as servants to fulfill your will, O oh Lord, and to do the work of your Son, since he is sitting at your right hand. We ask you, O oh Lord, to be with us as we go forward today, O oh Lord, and allow us to be thankful of all the blessings that you have continued to bestow upon us throughout this last week. Allow us to see clearly as we go into this next week, O oh Lord, the blessings as they flow unto us, and allow us to thank you, O oh Lord, for all that you do for us. We can never thank you enough for everything that you do for us. And without you, we are nothing, O oh Lord. And we thank you for our salvation. We thank you for our ability to go forward and witness unto the world and to do your work. For in doing that, we receive a blessing as well. Please be with us, O oh Lord, as we go forward. In your son's holy name I pray, Christ Jesus, amen.